I, I'll be speaking today. Dennis Letts uh, has returned home because he wasn't feeling well. Uh, on Monday, you heard from uh, Dennis Letts and De Dennis Cravens about their uh, DC gas discharge liner tube in a uh, CBEC calorimeter that was constructed specifically for it. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about thermal modeling of that system. And uh, it, it, it has some aspects in the modeling that I think that could be brought into almost any of your experiments to improve the confidence in the result. So I'm going to re begin by reviewing uh, what uh, Dennis Letts told you about his uh, system. It's a coaxial gas discharge to about an inch in diameter, and the whole thing's about a foot long, but not all of it uh, uh, is active. It has a small central molybdenum wire, and the active medium is planted on the inside of the coaxial tube. The cathode is the outer uh, conductor of this coaxial tube. Now, this tube is inserted into a copper block in the, uh, in, in the center of the calorimeter, and around the outside of the copper block are uh, disposed about on four sides, actually uh, five sides of this, it's disposed about 21 uh, CBEC modules. These are high temperature CBEC modules uh, to measure the heat as it exits from the system. So the, the primary source of the Lenner heat is going to be from the tube uh, that it's inserted in the middle and it will exit to the outside. The issue is that this copper block was it was designed to spread out the heat, uh, but it has a high thermal mass. Now, in order to operate at somewhat high, higher temperature, uh, there is provision in here for uh, four uh, cartridge heaters inserted in the block symmetrically around the tube. And this provides a, a thermal heat bias to the system to heat it up. Uh, so the, the, the total heat really amounts to coming either from the cartridge heaters, the LT dis, DC discharge, or any Lenner excess power that happens to be in the system. Now a common problem uh, that you have in this is that you'd like to have some real-time monitoring or even reporting of what the excess power is, but when you go to make the measurements in your data acquisition system, you'll you measure the input power almost instantaneously, but the output power is sensed as it has come through your calorimeter. And in Dennis's case, the, the main time constant for this uh, calorimeter is uh, about two hours. So it takes it a long time before you actually see the heat come out. And if, the, uh, if your uh, input is a step, as it was in this particular test, uh, the output is going to gradually rise, and for about 12 hours, it's not going to be quite valid. So if you're trying to do something like correlate uh, when the neutrons came out, and he didn't get neutrons, but we, we heard that reported earlier, to when the excess heat came out, well, you have this high uncertainty as to when exactly the excess heat was produced in this simple uh, method of computing the excess power. So it even gets more confusing when you look at a real experiment. You know, in this case, this is a long, multi-day experiment, and there were lots of uh, changes made uh, here and there in the experiment. And so having that long uh, time constant in his system makes it really difficult to understand, well, what caused what in the system. So what I was providing uh, to uh, their uh, effort was to model the, the thermal response of the system and try to do a better job of developing an understanding for what happened when. Now, thermal modeling can be done in a lot of ways. You could do it with a, si a solid model finite element analysis. The, the problem with that is that the simulation takes forever. It's, it's good as a design tool for your system, but it's not good as a an analysis tool after the fact. It just takes too long. You could also do behavioral modeling where you mathematically 
extract the impulse response and try to mathematically deconvolve your, uh, your excess power. But it's really hard to do what ifs. It's very hard to change. You basically have to do the whole uh, analysis over again from the start. What I chose to do is uh, equivalent circuit thermal modeling, and I used the SPICE simulator for that in a transient mode. It's simple to build your model and simple to change, and it's compatible with nonlinearities. And you will have those if you have any uh, convection or radiation in your system, you'll have nonlinearities. Non and it's easy to incorporate measured data in this, which is, it turns out to be really uh, important. The, the SPICE uh, simulators that are available today, even the free ones that you can get off of the internet, they, are, they are, have rich feature sets in terms of graphics and elements and variables, and they simulate quickly. On a typical PC, you can sim do a simulation in less than five seconds. So here are the core thermal modeling analogs that you need to wrap your head around. A voltage is going to correspond to temperature. So uh, when you have a voltage node in your simulation, it's an actually a temperature node. Charge corresponds to heat. So charge in coulombs, heat in joules. Current, which is charge flow in amperes, corresponds to heat flow in watts. So if you look at a thermal resistor, which is just an electrical resistor in the simulation, you have a temperature difference across it, and you end up with a heat flow through it in watts. Uh, and the resistors can easily be nonlinear in, in SPICE. Uh, thermal capacitors. You know, if you were to put a current source on a capacitor, you'd get a linear rise in voltage. If you put a, uh, a power source as a, modeled as a current source into a thermal capacitor, you get a linear rise in temperature. So these are the, these are the core uh, components for your, your thermal modeling in a uh, one-dimensional circuit type of model. Here are a couple of more um, uh, valuable elements. This little thing right here is an initial condition. You can place that in your simulation because you need to place what the initial temperature is. Uh, and it might be room temperature, but you need to place it in there and not presume that it's zero. The other important thing that, that you find in these SPICE tools is what's known as a piecewise linear source. And that is a text file driven source, whether it's a current source or a voltage source, which becomes a, a power uh, a, a thermal power source or a temperature source or sink, uh, you, you take a vector out of your data that you acquired in your actual experiment and put it in there and you drive the source with that and so you end up driving your simulation with your actual experimental data. And what it does is it, it's called piecewise linear interpolation because it interpolates between your samples. SPICE is a, uh, does not uh, simulate with uniform time steps. And so because of that, it needs to be able to uh, interpolate between. So let's take a look at modeling the Let's calorimeter. Here is the big uh, thermal time constant component, that big copper block. You can calculate what it, the thermal capacity of the block is, and it's, it's a number. I mean, it's a big number, and you, would use the, you will use this as the capacitance in your model. Uh, but it's, it's simple to get to the starting point. And this absolute number is not going to turn out to be terribly important uh, because the other unknown is the thermal resistance that goes with it in the, for the conduction through the, the, the block. Now, when you normally think about this, and he's got uh, CBAC modules on all sides of this block, might be thinking about the heat flow out to each of those blocks, but you don't really know what any of these resistor, thermal resistors are to start with. And in the end, you can combine them all into basically one equivalent thermal resistance, and you only have one unknown instead of all those other known, unknowns, because you're really not looking for the heat flow distribution as the result of this solution. So, and then you can think about the delay as the, uh, the heat passes from the center where it's being generated by the Lenner tube uh, to the outside surface where it will be detected in, as it passes through the uh, Seebeck modules. 
Well, the simple delay is your simple R and C here. And a better model is to split the resistor in half uh, with the same capacitance. And a better still is to distribute it just a little bit more. And very seldom is, it, uh, is there any advantage at all to going to split it up any more than this. And so the resulting circuit model, a good circuit model, would look like this for that delay. Now, there's, you've already calculated the capacitance. The unknown here is the resistance. So now modeling the Seebeck thermoelectric generator modules that are the detectors for the heat in this system, this module basically has a, an extremely low thermal resistance going through it of only 0.74 degrees C per watt, and he's got 20 of them in parallel. So it's like 0.037 uh, degrees C per watt. It's almost a, a short circuit for the heat flowing through there. And it generates a voltage, the module generates a voltage, an electrical output voltage that is uh, initially presumed to be a linear constant times the, uh, the heat that is flowing through the module. So here is sort of a first pass model for his system. You have the heat arriving in the center, passing through the delay. You have the Seebeck module as being the primary heat path to flow out to the uh, heat sink where it is presumably at uh, the ambient temperature. In his case, it is not, but it's not important. Uh, you have heat leakage to ambient, and you have heat leakage around your Seebeck modules to the heat sink. Well, we don't have to simulate the heat sink because he measured the temperature of the heat sink. You can go ahead and, and create this as a PWL source and put in your actual measured temperature for that sink there. That way you don't have to simulate that part. The ambient temperature, that he's, he measured the ambient temperature. You can use the actual experimental ambient temperature. And of course, you can use PWL sources for what he put into the system. Now, in the case of a null experiment, that would correspond to uh, there not being any unknowns in terms of heat. The unknowns are in terms of your unknown circuit values. So what you basically have here is you have uh, a measured output and a simulated output from a known input. And you're going to put in what you measured, not what you wanted to put in. You put in what you actually measured for the input, and you compare the measured output and the simulated output, and you adjust your parameters, uh, your unknown resistance, your unknown Seebeck coefficient. You adjust those until these two match, the simulated and the measured output match. And this process is really tedious, uh, it, and it's an iterative process. It's called parameter extraction. So here you can see uh, we, we chose a canonical step input experiment. And it's not a perfect step. This is the actual measured step. And this was what was put into the simulation. The surprising thing that came out of this was that there was more than one uh, heat propagating mode. You see this very long time constant mode of about two hours, but this, there's this very short uh, time constant mode on the front end of it, on the front porch. And where did that come from? After some research, it appears to be an actual second heat propagating mode that is known as a thermal wave or a non Fourier heat transfer mode. It's, a, it's an obscure uh, thermal uh, property, it's a characteristic. Uh, it's very interesting in itself, but it's sort of beside the point in the modeling. It just complicates the model a little bit. There's no reason why you can't put in two thermal modes in your model. So this is an example of what your SPICE simulator uh, looks like. Uh, you have uh, a, a circuit element window where you have your thermal modeling circuit, and you have your graphic output. You press a button to do a simulation, and blip, it comes back with the, the latest results. You change the value, and it Press the button again. This is a free uh, SPICE simulator. The one I use is called Symmetrix, and you can get it for free here. And the, 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 the transient mode is the mode that you use for simulation. But that's the strength of SPICE. Uh, it's a very well-developed old simulator. Now, one of the things that we did to confirm that that front porch 
uh, fast rise time was not a nonlinearity in the CBEX, was we did a stair step uh, excitation of the system. And in the stair step, uh, if it was nonlinearity, you would see it show up as a change in time constant from uh, the, uh, the small early stair step to, the, to this one. But what you see is while there is nonlinearity in this, the, it's not in the time constant. And so this is a, an actual uh, different propagating mode. Now I will mention that this is the, the uh, model and simulated value of after parameter extraction. This is the kind of match that you can expect to get between experimental and, th and, and simulated results. They overlay. Uh, it, it is a sufficient model to do this in 1D. So here's the final extracted model, and it's, a, and it's a bit more complicated than that simple model because we also are modeling his lid that he puts over the top portion of his calorimeter that is uh, a whole separate section and has its, its own set of time constants. Uh, now, what you really want to use this model for is now you've got a system where you have known elements in your model. You don't need to adjust anything there. You have a measured output and simulated output, and you have a measured input, but you have an unknown excess heat waveform in there. And what you'd like to do is to be able to adjust the excess heat waveform and extract it like you extracted other parameters uh, so that the simulated output matches the measured output. The problem with this is that this is a problem in deconvolution which is known as an ill-conditioned problem due to noise. And what happens is the noise in the system can make the answer arbitrary at some frequency range. So as your XP uh, propagates through the, the long time constant calorimeter, the high frequency components in that waveform are being attenuated and they're falling down and have no signal to noise. And so that's one of the problems. So you have to be careful to not try and extract the waveform into a region where it's all noise and the answer is arbitrary. So one of the cool ways that uh, we came up with to do this was to not use a manual way to do the, uh, the extraction, but to use the power of the SPICE simulator itself. What we did was we basically took the output and subtracted the input and we fed it back in a negative feedback way back to the input. And the negative feedback will cause the, the uh, simulated and the experimental outputs to match. It drives it to match. And so what happens is this is essentially ex doing that deconvolution extraction. Uh, what I did to test whether or not this actually worked was I injected a mock excess power waveform, and it was a triangle waveform, and you can see that it was recovered there. Okay, so here's some modeling tips that, that you ought to keep in mind. Don't model anything that you've measured. Only, only model those things that you don't uh, have data for. Uh, sample 10 times faster than your shortest time constant. Dennis Letts got a surprise in the fact that there was this fast mode in his system, and he really could have used five times faster sampling. The thermal capacitors and the metallic conduction resistors are likely going to always be linear. Uh, the modeling for the, the convection and radiation, those are the places where you'd want to insert a nonlinear resistance. Also, as we heard previously mentioned, uh, true endothermic uh, regions in the excess power waveform are exceedingly rare. And so if you're seeing those, there's probably still more you need to add to your model. So modeling, in, in this case, did turn up some error sources. We found that, some, that there was some heater lead wire dissipation that was actually occurring outside the, calor, uh, the calorimeter, and so it it created uh, a calibration error in the simple calibration uh, uh, technique. And we found a number of new sources that we needed to uh, model. Uh, this included that when you were letting gas into the evacuated tube, 
which sometimes he did during the course of the experiment, uh, you got Joule Thompson cooling uh, in there, just like your air conditioner at home. And when you uh, turned on the DC discharge, uh, the, the gas in there was, it became ionized, but it became heated. And so you were storing heat in the plasma, and when you turned off the DC discharge, that was released. So here's an example of the XP extracted from uh, modeling. You can see, and, and this is a good place uh, to look at the difference. Notice how flat the extracted excess power waveform is compared to the simply extracted uh, waveform. Uh, it, it develops a lot of confidence because you can go back and adjust the model and uh, uh, get to the uh, take out error sources that you find. So, in conclusion, the modeling increases your understanding of the system, and you'll find things that you didn't expect to find in your system uh, when, you, when you go through this process. It improves the signal to noise in the extracted XP because you're building in signal to noise from the other experiments that you did to generate the model. Uh, the XP waveform extraction gives you a better capability to identify what caused the excess heat or what correlated with it. And these free spice simulators are really valuable as thermal modeling tools. So thanks for listening. Let me uh, say that we, we owe a, a deep debt of gratitude to industrial heat for supporting this activity. And while this modeling work was meant to add uh, credibility to the excess heat from that experiment. Uh, industrial heat has a really high standard for what it takes to be able to claim excess heat, and this did not meet that criteria yet. So here's the criteria. Okay. So two quick questions. We'll go with Matthew first. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I have a question, very simple uh, question about the, the evaluation of conduction paths within the system because sometimes uh, the difference in um, uh, thermal expansion of the different material tend to create a uh, conduction path that would be changing the behavior of the, uh, of, of the cell itself. Have you evaluated that? Uh, we didn't see that in uh, Dennis's system as becoming something that would be like some kind of a stepwise change in the response or the behavior of the model. It, uh, it, it appeared to be very reproducible. And those are the things that you should watch for in your system, particularly if you see steps and change in behavior, because those normally signal something mechanical happening rather than something uh, normal thermal behavior. And we didn't see that in his system. Very nice, Bob. I like the approach. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make your modeling uh, more complicated and time-consuming. The, the, uh, the claim made, a claim made for uh, com uh, complete envelope Seebeck calorimetry is that the response is independent of the source position, which it, of course it can't be because the Seebeck coefficient itself is temperature dependent. So each of those Seebecks is actually operating with a different uh, Seebeck coefficient. And this often worried me. I mean, people make uh, measurements of it and say, it doesn't matter where I put my uh, heat source in the box. But if there are differences in temperature position affecting differences in Seebeck coefficient, then the response will, will, will be dependent on that uh, position. Your model can prove to us how, how little that effect is and, and that we don't need to worry about it. Well, we did end up with some problems with that because, uh, I mean, Dennis had hoped that the, that the big copper block right. was going to sort of average out changes in position of heat in the, uh, the Leonard tube. Unfortunately, one of the things that we found and, what, and was presented on Monday with it where he showed the uh, thermal images that were taken of the, the tube outside the box, if the discharge was allowed to run while it was being evacuated or gas was being put back in, 
there were some modes that could be excited where the, the, the glow would be right, right up at the top. Right. And when it was up at the top, then most of the heat would be trying to come out of his, the lid in his calorimeter. And the time constant in that was much different. And so it, it, yeah, it that, created an accuracy problem. The, different effect from the one that I was talking about. But, but yeah, he, and he has, has some other uh, uh, things with this that could be improved. Mm. I mean, he would be better off if he measured the, uh, the temperature of the heat sinks in many places, and, and then you could break it out and have a separate coefficient for each module if you wanted. Right, but, but, uh, but nice approach, thanks. Well, thank you for your nice presentation.